So welcome to another episode of the Talking Balls podcast and we're just at the point now where we're just post crucible and um, we're just looking at this long summer ahead but the content keeps coming for us and we're determined to keep bringing you some interesting stuff. I think we've said before on social media that we're alternating so we're looking to bring in new guests but throughout the summer we'll also reload some of our previous episodes as well but this time it's um, well I was saying no, it needs some introduction, but then you wouldn't know who it was. Um, but we have ourselves, uh, well, a very interesting guest who I'm really looking forward to finding out more about. But before I go any further, this is Michael, and I'll hand you over to my co-host to say hello for himself. Yeah, hi everyone, welcome aboard. Um, welcome aboard. Uh, world class referee today, and thoroughly nice guy, one of the best in the business. Really looking forward to a chat today. Well, there's a build-up, Leo. So, Leo Scullion's our guest today. Hi, Leo. Hi there. How are we doing? <laughs> We're all good. We're excited about meeting you, and we've probably got lots of questions that when we sit and watch the coverage, we think, oh, do you know what? If I ever got to ask a referee about that, then I'll ask him this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that'd be quite a short list, I would think. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how, how are you? I mean, uh, just not long now off the, you know, back off the Crucible, but also... The world championships, but then the seniors as well. So you, you've yeah. had a very busy time. How are things? Are you back home? Yeah, I'm back home. Glad to be. The weather's a bit overcast today, but um, not glad to be home. It was a, a long and very busy season. Um, quite tiring. And although we haven't been abroad, well, apart from Turkey, which was fantastic, mm. um, we haven't had our usual long, long trips to China. Mm. It's still very, very busy and very hectic. So nice to be finished. I'm not doing Q school this year. Um, so this will be me until possibly mid-July, I think, is the first lot of qualifiers. Championship League snooker during most of July, but uh, that's, there's only one or two refs do that usually. So no, I think for me it'll be mid-July before I'm back. So I'm looking forward to some good weather, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, so we all deserve break, Leo. And uh, you've been doing this for a long time now. It's fair to say, you know, you started on the tour in 1999. Uh, but what, what did you do before that? What was your jobs before you started refereeing? Um, I was a police officer in Glasgow uh, for 20 years. And then I finished that in 97. And then um, I did a couple of sort of small things as a a thing called uh, precognitions in Scotland where you take statements on behalf of solicitors mm -hmm. so that they have some insight as to what the evidence against their client might be. So I did that for a wee while. But obviously with the police background, I was used to taking statements. So that was quite interesting. Got to meet some interesting people. Um, and then in order to try and allow myself the time to become more involved with snooker, I was driving a taxi, so that meant that I was a bit more flexible and I could take the time when I needed it. And that, that was really what gave me the opportunity to, to work as much as I could at Snooker. And, and just uh, just to ask Leo, what was the harder job, Snooker refereeing or being a policeman in Glasgow? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, they both have done moments, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I would I'd much rather be refereeing than yeah. walking the streets of Glasgow. Certainly nowadays. I mean, I see some of the, the guys doing it now and the girls that are out there. And, oh, my God. They yeah, look more like military with these belts they have to use with all the equipment. And uh, in my day, this is what got you into trouble and out of trouble sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how did you get into the refereeing then? Um... When I was when I was in the police, um, there's a lot of great sort of snooker players, billiards players, athletes in general in the police force throughout the whole UK. Mm. But they're very often not able to take part in local competitions because of the shift pattern. 
So the police have their own athletic association. Um, and the indoor games part of that involves snooker, billiards, table tennis and darts. And in 1984-85, Strathclyde Police were hosting the British Police Championships. And a friend of mine, Bruce Duncan, who was also a referee we watched mm. for a while, um, he knew that I was interested in snooker and had started to play the game and asked me if I was interested. I said, of course, yeah, I could referee that. At which point he said, no, no, this is like a proper competition. You actually have to be a qualified referee. So again, me being me, I thought, yeah, I can do that. I know what I'm doing. Real book, read that, you're setting an exam. I started looking through it and then realised that I don't know the rules of this game that I've been playing <laughs> for a couple of years now. Um, so yeah, that, that was it started there. So our first exam, referee that does that British Police Championships in Erskine. Um, yeah. Just went from there. And of course, yeah. uh, Ewan Henderson, he was, uh, was, yeah, was yeah, a multiple yeah, uh, police player. champion. Yeah. He's obviously player, a professional yeah. player as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't seen much of him since... He finished on the pro circuit and then joined the police. But yeah, I think he's done very well in the, the police championships. Yeah. Really. In fact, he's probably a veteran police officer now. He's been, he's been involved that long. Was he still doing it? Yeah. As far as I know. Yeah. But I say, I haven't, I haven't heard or much shot of him since for a long time. Mm. Of course, the, the exams you've got to go through, Leo, they're, they're quite stringent as well. Uh, I mean, the stuff you've got to know about that your, your normal snooker player wouldn't have a clue about. Yeah, it's, uh, but then, it's, class, it's class one, sorry, Leo, is class one the highest level you're refereeing or is it higher? Um, class, class one is really the amateur game. Right, right. That's the highest in the amateur game. Um, but you can, you can dip your toe in the water of the professional game from class two where you can go to referee Q school, for example. Um, and you'll be, the, the assessment systems in the process, I think, have been changed at the moment, but generally you'll be assessed during Q school. When I joined, I joined a thing called the PRA, which is a Professional Referees Association, and that mm -hmm. was your route into World Snooker. And having joined that, you were on a probation for two years and you got some work with World Snooker and you were assessed at that, and if you were deemed good enough, then you became a full member of the PRA and went from there. Now it's slightly different that you can go to Q school. Um, and I mean, the other European events and international events, the assessors can go and view referees that are from the amateur game. And if they are uh, deemed good enough, they'll get their chance. And yeah. Just from there. But I think like, I mean, I don't know, but it's probably the same in most sports where players, like footballers probably, <laughs> it's probably a bad one because I don't think MD understands the offside rule, but um, players or athletes take part in whatever their event is. And it's only as they progress that they, they have to conform to the rules and the etiquette of the game. And they probably never have to actually know the rules inside out. It's helpful. But, um, and sometimes it saves explanations um, at the table for us because the, the thing you don't want to do is interrupt the game because players all play at a tempo and at their own pace and such like Yeah. So if something happens and you have to have this long discussion about it, then it interrupts the whole game and really you don't want it unless it's absolutely necessary. And does that does that love of the game, Leo? You, you said about you know when you're in the police, this was something you liked anyway. I mean, is is that come from playing as a youngster, and it's just evolved from there? I just kind of wonder where because you, um, you can play. You've played as well, haven't you? Yeah, but um, when you first pick up a cue and hit balls about, um, you begin to think that you're getting the hang of it, and at some point you may think you're actually quite good. And then you may have the misfortune in this, and I use it advisedly, to come across a professional snooker player and then you immediately realise that I better put this cue away because yeah. these guys are so special. Um, but my, my first ever memory of uh, a snooker table was, God, I must have been maybe about 10, I think. 
And we used to go on family holidays to Largs in the Easter Coast. Mm-hmm. And my father took me into um, some sort of fisherman's institute or a working man's institute in Largs. And there was two snooker tables in it. And I, of course, at that age, they looked absolutely massive. Um, and that was the first time I ever remember having anything to do with snooker and trying to hit a snooker ball. Um, and then, sort of, that was it for, for many, many years. And I didn't really properly have a dad at school, and we all used to take study time. <laughs> yeah, I'm betting commas. Euphemism, isn't it? For yeah. School. Um, and ended up in snooker halls. But it wasn't, it really wasn't until I joined the police that uh, I got introduced to the game and had the, the chance to, to learn more and uh, actually play it. And I've, I've always been really interested, uh, Leo, uh, to sort of know if the referees can play snooker. So can you play a bit of snooker? How good are you? And who would you say is the best referee um, playing snooker? So some of the referees are very, very good. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's a referee from years gone by who, who has had a 147. Wow. The name escapes me, but it was, when I was first joining the Referees Association, I'm sure there was talk of a referee. Someone, when they see the, the podcast, um, might remember who it was. It's a shame that I can't remember his name. Mm-hmm. But I'm sure there was a referee at the 147. But currently, there's, there's referees play. Um, I used to think it was okay. But as years have gone by, I'm, I now need my glasses all the time. Yeah. So I can see the table and the balls and the shot. But as soon as I get down to play, I'm having to look over the top of my glasses. And that's just... Yeah, you, you need a pair of tennis tailors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe years ago, it would have been worthwhile. But I, I don't play very occasionally. I'll go. To, I mean, in fact, I've been a lot more recently, a friend of mine, to a club here. Um, but for years and years, I didn't. Because I was away working, and then when I was back, I was either working in a taxi mm-hmm. or for a while doing other jobs, and then trying to spend time with the family. So, yeah, the, the playing side of the game definitely went. But, uh, no, I, I loved it when I did play. It was great. Is, is your highest break not about 93 or yeah. something like that? Yeah, 93. Yeah. That's good shooting. Why? <laughs> and uh, it was one of those... Um, you, you sometimes hear the commentators and I might say he couldn't have placed them better <laughs> he yeah. it was one of those where the balls were just perfect and I didn't really have to do anything except pot them mm. um, but now I'm lucky if I got a 9 and a 3 and a 9 and a 3 I think my probably my claim to fame was winning the, the Scottish Police Doubles Championship and then getting through to the final of the British Police Doubles Championship. Me and a fellow called David O'Brien, um, who the, 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 I haven't seen for a long, long time, but him and I were uh, partners in the, the police teams. So that, that was the claim to fame <laughs> of winning a tournament. Fantastic. I'm really interested, Leo, in what you said there. Lee's, Lee's taking you down the route there about how the you know the referees either play or do stuff. Uh, it does it feel like a bit of a club, you know, an exclusive referees club? Are you close to each other? Do you talk about how you're handling games or the players, that kind of stuff? Um, uh, not so much, really. I think, um, I mean, it is sort of one team, but within that, you have your own. I mean, when, you, when you're working then, you're just all mucking in to get the job done. Because there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, like preparing, like, like the wets and dries for the players' tables and the water and all that sort of stuff. And very often that will fall to us to, to deal with that. And then if you're in a game that's of a high enough profile that you actually have a marker, then you've got the relationship with you and the marker, um, relying on them. But other than that, you know, everybody's got their own friendships and uh, you discuss things with, with different people. It's just like any other workplace, I suppose. Um, there's not yeah, really... Sort of sorry, carry, carry on, Neil. Carry on. I was, I was just going to say, there's not really, like, a, a set, sit down and meet 
Um, before every event begins on our, what we call our travel day, we always have a, a referee's briefing. And if there was any queries that had come up from, say, perhaps a, a previous event, then that's when they would come out and people would talk about it. Yeah, because because I was going to ask, you know, obviously we see you guys refereeing on the telly and stuff, but I was going to ask what what are your what are you expected to do? You know, what you've got other duties like marking and and but you've just said it there, yeah. you've got to get the, the the tables ready and stuff like that. Yeah, well, we I mean, really <clears throat> from from when we step into the booth, shall we say, so like the, the playing arena, when we step in there with the players, we are in charge of anything that's going on. Yeah. And unless there was like, say, a lighting failure or a big problem with the table, we make all the decisions. If there was a, a lighting failure, then we would go and get some, because that's something out with our control. Yeah. But anything to do with the, the match is down to us. But before that, before you get to that point, we are responsible for, um, let's take it from the beginning of the session you're playing. So you go in and find out who, what match you're doing. You then have to go and find the players to make sure that they're in, make sure that they're dressed properly. There's all sorts of dress things now, depending on logos and ties and goodness knows what. Yeah. Um, and then there'll be a set meeting point which will have been discussed at the briefing that I mentioned earlier. So let's say, for argument's sake, it's at the players' lounge. You tell the players where you'll meet them five minutes before the start of play. Um, we're usually there beforehand because we, you know, once we've gone and set the table up and done all that preparation, we're then just hanging about waiting for the, the matches to start. And if, the, if, yes, if there's either no sign of a player at that point, or a player that you've previously seen and now has disappeared for some reason, then you notify the tour director and then they'll mm. go with that side of things. And if it comes to the bit where <coughs> the matches are about to start and you go out to the table, if one player's not there, you would go out with the other player and go through the procedure of docking frames, mm. a frame to start with. Um, meanwhile, there's probably oh hell going on backstage trying to find out what's <laughs> happened to you know where the player is something happened to him is you okay or she okay um so yeah it's there's a lot more going on before we actually start hitting balls on the table yeah i think that's what we love on this podcast it's uh, equally with the players just getting a bit of that behind the scenes and you know we're, mm -hmm. we're probably quite geeky about that we really enjoy hearing about all this stuff but um and just just as you say just getting you know what what goes off behind the scenes what happens what things are you thinking when you're there you know we often ask the players what are they thinking when they're sat in the chair and their opponents smashing a break and and often they're just trying to keep themselves together. But uh, what strikes me watching you guys is the level of concentration you must have to maintain during any match mm -hmm. because it might be that somebody fouls, you've got to bring the, put the balls back where they were. And I know you, I know in a lot of the games you get assistance with that, but that yeah. to me seems like one of the, the big ones. Like you, when you watch the referees, how eagle-eyed they are. They're watching everything, the position of the player, making sure they're not touching anything they shouldn't touch, the feet is on yeah. the floor, all the rest of it. I mean, the levels of concentration and in quite a quiet atmosphere, you, you, you must have to really zone in for this. Yeah, it's, in, in the perfect game or match, it will finish and you walk away and think, that was quite good. <laughs> and you, you've just been completely zoned in. Probably like a lot of the players are, they may come off after a match and think it went really smoothly. And maybe that's an indication that they're completely uh, zoned in, as it were, as you say, with the concentration. But really, it's, I think a lot of it comes with experience. The more you do, the more you get used to um, pinpointing where the, the cue ball is. Um, and it, it, sometimes, but when you get caught out as, let's say, the cue ball is somewhere between the yellow on its spot and the side cushion, and there's loads of reds on. 
and there's like I say nothing difficult. I mean, it's always difficult, but um, nothing obviously dangerous going on. If a player plays a shot there and misses the ball, sometimes you get completely caught. You like mm. the last thing you were expecting yeah. was no contact. And then the cue ball was in the middle of nowhere. There was nothing next to it, nothing. You know, so sometimes you know, just put your hands up and say, like, I just I missed that. Oh, you need to help me out. Um, but very often you will realise when there's danger. Not, you know, it's hard to sort of try and set up a scenario. Because somewhere in behind the ball colours. There's a, and the player, you can see that the player's choosing to come off a side cushion for tactical reasons, but it maybe could go equally between the to the, the ball colours. Mm. So then, then you're sort of alert because he's got an easy, well, a straightforward shot, a direct shot, but he's choosing for tactical reasons to come off a cushion. Yeah. And you, you need to go on the ball because if he doesn't hit that, you want that to be back spot on. So then you're looking for all sorts of clues, whereas in relation to the ball line or the one of the, the ball colours and looking equally, are the, are the balls further down, pink and black, are they on their spots? Because if they're on their spots and, and he does hit one of them or he misses, mm. and then it's easier to put them back because at least you've got a starting point if you have to put the pink on its spot. You can start with mm. that and work around it. So, yeah, it's just... It's a different kind of concentration, I suppose. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, given the concentration you've got to put into the matches, Leo, can you actually enjoy the match that you're refereeing? You know, given, um, given that there's a lot going on round about you, crowds, as you've mentioned before, and, you know, can you enjoy it? I think you don't really enjoy it maybe until afterwards. Mm -hmm. Because you are concentrating. Um, I mean, I've seen me after a match, like, later that night, or the next day is talking about a match and someone will say, that was a great game yesterday. And for certainly a few minutes, you're like, <laughs> it goes completely. Yeah. And maybe that's because you're concentrating so much on the table that the identity of the players is almost secondary mm -hmm. because your concentration is good. Um, I don't know, it's, it's weird. The, the, the weirdest one of that I saw was but Alan Chamberlain was still refereeing. We were doing world qualifiers. <clears throat> and we were the, the, they were in the EIS in Sheffield. And we were staying in a hotel just along the road. And between sessions, a few of us had gone back for a bite to eat. And as we walked into the hotel, John Parrott was walking out. And he said to Alan, he said hello to Alan, said, oh, there's a game going, he says, ah, it's fine. And Alan, uh, John said to him, so who are you refereeing? Alan couldn't tell him. He don't just finish the, the, the frame for the mid-session, well, mid but the end of the first nine frames. <laughs> had no idea who he was refereeing. Just and it's so just one of those things. It's just concentrating so much on the table. Yeah. But you didn't know. And of course, know yeah, of course, you know, when the players miss a shot or play a safety shot, they can go back to the seat sit down and if, if they want zone out for a little bit but you've got to be yeah. on it all the time and you're on your feet all the time as well yeah. must be really difficult yeah um sometimes you get depending on the floor which might sound daft but <laughs> so many different types of floor surface and yeah. as you're walking around uh you, you get it in the, the calf muscles it's really mm. really tiring um re thankfully Recently, I've not had many blisters, but very often you end up with blisters in your feet. And that's, uh -huh. that's uncomfortable when you're walking around. Um, and I, I don't really know whether that's a floor or if it just happens to be the kind of socks you're wearing rubbing against the shoes. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, there's all these wee things that are going on that obviously, hopefully nobody ever notices. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's tiring and uh, strange because at the end of a match, you can come off and elated because it's been a good match and everything's went well and then if you're daft enough to read social media you'll read how terrible you've been because all the experts at home have told you how bad you've been um, but, <laughs> the armchair referees yeah, yeah yeah and you think oh, I seem to remember that was quite a good match um, <laughs> but you, you'll never if you well for me anyway 
if I finish late at night, I can never like go back to the hotel, just go to sleep. Yeah, you've got to unwind. The hotel is on, or you're having coffee, or if it's early enough, you maybe have a pint of beer, but nah, it's just, it reminds me of the days when I watched shifts in the police. Mm-hmm. I would finish a back shift at 11 o'clock at night, and I would never go home, go to bed, and go to sleep. It's no. just because your, mind, your mind's going. And that's probably the same for people who do shifts, and the players are probably the same as well. Yeah. Despite mm-hmm. the fact that you are tired, because when you eventually do calm down and go to sleep, you sleep. You know, like a baby. Yep. <laughs> Unless it's Michael's baby, up every hour. All right. Oh, yeah. Starting to improve there, Lee. An update. Ten weeks old. Starting to to improve on that front. So how many weeks? Get, uh, ten weeks. Just over ten. All weeks. right. All right. <laughs> so he's he's getting there. He's improving. We we can get a few frames in now when he's asleep, rather than just <laughs> the, the break off and uh, halfway you, through a tactical you battle. The priorities right there, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you mentioned there earlier about the about you know actually it's really interesting thinking about the the tiredness the the physical toll and all the rest of it. I suppose the other bit that comes up a lot with players, especially around the crucible, is that still fresh in the mind. It's about the dimensions, particularly around the two table setup. Um, does does that cause you any worries? I mean, obviously Neil Robertson says it affects his kind of lead into his shots. Um, you've got, you've obviously got to keep moving so that you're not in yeah. the way of the players and putting you're, yourself in the place where you can not, see what's going on. You've obviously not seen me standing next to Neil recently because he's somewhat taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, he's actually trying to play shots. But uh, it, it does have an effect um, because you can find yourself trapped in certain positions. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is all part of what makes the crucible a special place that it is. Um, but those um, wee water tables that the players have, the some players immediately move the water from that wee almost circular table to either the, the divide between them or behind them. Mm-hmm. And it's quite good because it wouldn't be the first time that a referee, and I've done it myself, in order to try and see the line of a shot, you've bent down to see it and your backside crashes against yeah. the, the water. <laughs> I don't think I've ever knocked one over. I'm sure someone will correct me, but uh, I know it has happened. Glasses have gone, bottles of water have gone, and it, it sort of lightens the mood sometimes. You sort of get it. I don't know how much you want to say, really, Leo, but it'd be useful to get an intro- introduction into some of the players and how they, how they come across. Because you must see them also in the players' lounge. But you know, I'm, I'm guessing some of them are chattier in certain games. Some of them won't say a word. Have you got yeah. any, you know, anything that stands out about players in terms of what you pick up on them in terms of their personalities? Um, generally, I find that if, if if you're in a venue and the players are there for practice, so casually dressed and they're in either the day before or the the day of their match, but well before they're actually playing, then yeah, they can be chatty in between having practice shots. And then when you see them dressed to play, they've got their game face on and very often they don't want to talk to anybody. Um, Stephen Hendry was like that. Mm. Yeah, game face, don't talk. And you, you soon know. So you, there's no point in even. It's not, a, I don't mean that the way it sounds. It's like sort of respecting, I suppose, that that's yeah. them, that they're, that they're there to play and they're about to play. I mean, it might only be half an hour to the play. So they don't want to talk and have conversations about golf or football or anything like that. Uh, so you, you just pick up these things and know. Why not to speak to people? But uh, I with that, yeah, most of them are fine. You get some that are, you know, chat at the table from time to time, especially if something funny happens, uh, mm-hmm. because it, it breaks that tension. Mm. Um, and possibly for some, it, it breaks it in a bad way, because then they either miss the next shot or it so, somehow interrupts their, their, their thought process. But no, it's... And of course, Michael, we heard this from Billy Snadden, didn't we? He said he was playing Hendry in the semi-final of a tournament abroad and they had to go down the lift to the venue 
Mm. And Billy mm. said that Henry said nothing to him in that lift. Yeah. <laughs> Never even looked at him. Yeah. I can and imagine. of course, th those guys are good friends. Yeah. I think Steve Davis was the same. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think most players are like that, certainly, um, as they're waiting to be introduced. You get the odd <laughs> ones where if they are really good friends, they'll have a chit chat about something. I suppose as well, it might depend on whether it's the first round mm. or if it's the final. Yeah. But it's in the first round, they're maybe a bit more relaxed, whereas obviously the final, that's it for the title. And, and taking you back really to, well, probably that, well, it is the highest profile game and certainly, the, you know, the time you refereed in the final. So looking back now, what, 2019? Yeah. Um, um, what what are your memories of that? I mean, that must have been presumably just something you. I imagine you went to bed excited about, got up excited about that you were going to be refereeing the the biggest game in the in the whole of the calendar. Yeah, I was strangely calm. Mm. It was it actually took me by surprise because for me, um, I'm mostly nervous just before the start of a match um, which has always been a good thing as far as I'm concerned because it means that it kind of keeps you on your toes the yeah. day that I go out there and I'm completely yeah this is then something bad's going to happen mm -hmm. the trick is I think to keep the 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 nerves in the stomach and don't don't let them get up here but just keep them down here um, but on the day of the final yeah, I was strangely calm. Uh, I don't know whether I'd used up all my nervous energy, <laughs> but my wife was down. Um, so we'd spent some time together. And between the second round and the final itself, you, you don't referee, you, you just do marking duties and other stuff behind the scenes. So by the time the final comes, you're just itching to get back refereeing again. Mm -hmm. But it was, I mean, what a final. <laughs> <laughs> What's a final? You've got to be one of the best ever. Um, yeah, I mean, 11 yeah. centuries, 11 centuries, Leo, uh, seven by Trump, four by Higgins. Yeah. And, awesome. you know, that, that must have been a great final for you to referee as well, because uh, from what I can see, I don't know them, but they seem like really genuine, nice guys. And, and the match yeah. was played in great spirits. Oh, and, yeah. and obviously, by the looks of it, there wasn't a lot of safety play. So you're just picking balls out. <laughs> Yeah, it was just, it was absolutely awesome. And I think also it, that final set the record for the number of centuries in the Crucible final, which has mm. since been beaten. I think it was, I think, well, it was beaten this year and I think it was beaten, was it 2021? Um, so, yeah, I was, uh, it was just fantastic. As you say, played in a great spirit. Yeah. Um, both applauding each other's attempts at the 4-7. Um, when John doubled that, <laughs> double, I mean, I don't know what he was playing, but what a shot he's played to double the red. And Judd was just laughing and applauding, you know, tapping his knees. Just, and he um, was perfect on the black, Leo, and then yeah, he yeah. that black. Yeah, yeah, I know. But the road that went up, it, it was deafening. It must have been deafening in the crucible, but the road that yeah. went up when Higgins doubled that red, I think, incredible. Uh, I haven't spoken to John about it, but it would be interesting to know if, with hindsight, if he felt that if he just got down and played it, would, it, would he have got it? Because yeah. he definitely did wait for the crowd to have their applause mm -hmm. and cheer the shot um, before he played the, the black. At least that's how it seemed to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, there's absolutely nothing I could have done because even if I tried to quiet people down, yeah, you know, you'd have been like me whispering because <laughs> they've been enjoying it so much. Um, but yeah, I must ask them sometime. Oh, well, you guys may get a chance to do it before me, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But of course, then some frames later on, Judd had his chance, and just like Higgins kept that break going, Judd kept the break going with some amazing yeah. spot and of his oh, own. Right. It was it was incredible, yeah. I think, um. That's my wife just back in. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> You've been out doing a bit of shopping. Um, 
Yeah, I think um, no, nobody would have beaten Judge. He was just so good. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think there might be matches that John will reflect on beating the world champs or elsewhere, but he might think, you know, he might feel bad, you know, that he maybe had a chance or it was, you know, he should have done this or he should have done it. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. But I think he probably reflects on that one and just realises... Just outplayed. No, no, nobody could have beaten Judd. John played great. He played great. Mm -hmm. just played Fantastic. A wee bit greater. Um, <laughs> it was an absolute joy to referee. It really was fantastic. Enjoyed every second of it. I would have minded that one going 1817. That would have been brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. brilliant. <laughs> uh, just a few more frames of fantastic snooker. Yeah. Do you, do you tend to watch much snooker, Leo? You know, when you're not involved refereeing yourself, do you do you either watch live I am, or watch I am TV? one of the worst spectators. Uh, <laughs> in, in what way? I just, I think because I've been so lucky to be so close, and when you're that close, obviously, you're doing a job. So to be sitting on the sofa watching a bit of snooker, I can't. I shouldn't say I get bored and it's nothing to do with the match. I think it's my lack of involvement in it. Yeah. Um, and I'm easily distracted and I start looking at my phone and I've got to make a cup of tea and, and, mm. uh, and then I fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a tactical game, the click click of the, the balls mm. as they are playing safety and tactics, then you're just gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're not watching the referees, then. You never, you never kind of have a game where you just. I mean, I suppose the best ones you don't notice anyway because they're doing the yeah. job. And if it's yeah. not controversial, then there's nothing that stands out, is there? But you get the odd one, don't you? You know, the one where obviously kind of Ronnie had a go this year, and that kind of distracted a bit from the game. And Judd Trump was saying, "Does this have to be done now?" All the rest of it. Are you probably aware of that one? Um, yeah. yeah. I just wonder. Do you, you know? Do you share stories between you? I can't remember where I listened, but somebody was saying about certain players that don't exactly enjoy refereeing, and there's one very obvious one who comes up whenever you say that. I'm not <laughs> going to push you to say it. Um, but do, do you tend to find yourself watching how the others do it and find that interesting, or is it um, not for you? No, not really. Um, usually, the... The, the shot that the TV show you is that overhead shot of the table. So you really don't see a lot of the rest unless, as you say, there's some sort of something to be discussed. Um, sometimes you'll see, for whatever reason, maybe just the camera angle that lets you see what the ref's doing and you, or you'll pick up on something. Um, I mean, I've noticed refs more, oh, they've probably been doing it forever and I've just noticed it recently. Very often, if a colour's put, well, usually the pink, but if the pink is potted, I'll see them measuring the spot before they take the pink out of the pocket and then mm -hmm. either putting it back or putting it wherever it's going to go. And I've just thought, hmm, that's a thing I never do. But, mm -hmm. but that's it, not because I think it's good, bad and indifferent, it's just like, oh, I don't do that. Um, and that's, that's probably the extent I've noticed what the referee does. But as you say, if you don't notice the referee, it's usually a compliment. Yeah, yeah. I'm quite happy that people have said in the past, uh, again, social media does this thing, uh, you compliment you on the one hand and then rip you to pieces on the, <laughs> the other. Um, people will say, I, I didn't realise who was refereeing and then it was such and such a referee. And that's, mm. that's a compliment. Because you don't want to be. Because at the end of the day, the players are the stars. So yeah. uh, the less anyone notices me or us, as, as far as I'm concerned, a good thing. Yeah, there's been one of the talking points, hasn't there, in the tournament this year? I think one of them was around, and I'm trying, Lee will remember, hopefully, but I'm trying to remember. There was one about cleaning the balls and, and almost using that tactically. That I can't remember which game that was now, but that certainly came up during this year's tournament. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Um, who was playing? I know it was Jan Bengtao 
Uh, That's right, it was Yang Bin Tao, yeah. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember who he was, but it was a play Mark Selby, I think, maybe. And from, I've, I've only seen bits of it. The thing is, this is where, if I'd been sitting watching the whole match, you would have got more of a, an insight. But it certainly looked to me as if he, he'd gone down to look at the shot, and I saw, I'm sure it was Rob, Rob Spencer, was reffing it. And I saw that Rob was looking because the, the camera angles showed you the shot from the corner pocket. Yeah. And they were discussing in commentary where, how tight it was. Mm. And then young Ming Tao went down, looked at the shot. Yeah. Is, is there any, any rules you would change, Leo, in the game? Or do you think we've got it right? Um, there's always a usual discussion about the film and a miss, but I think the film and a miss is fine. Yeah, I really do. I think the, the most difficult one I find is the simultaneous hit. Mm. Um, and I think there's an argument for there's an argument for having a discussion about whether that should be or continue to be a foul. Um, because I think it's pretty obvious when a player hits, let's say if he's on a red, if he hits the colour first. It's pretty obvious that, you know, or, or if it's not, and we're fortunate enough to, uh, for it to be a TV match, we can check it. Simultaneous hit, it's such a hard one to see. Yeah. And unless the player's playing it almost a dead weight, and it's, it's really hard to imagine when that is, because usually they're trying to pot. Mm -hmm. It's whether it pots or whether it doesn't pot. Um, so that, that's a really difficult one because the human eye can't, well, I don't think you can see. And if a player's playing at any kind of pace at all, it's so difficult. But the, the discussion on the foul and a miss, to me, seems to centre around its use in the amateur game. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think professional players are all happy with it. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, I've had situations where I've called a miss and I've seen a player look at his opponent and then have it put back and then the opponent plays the shot again and this time I haven't called a miss because there's been a, a difference in the outcome and the player said to me, I, I, what was it? it was something along the lines of I'd have been quite just as happy if you hadn't called it the first time. Right. So I said to him after it, so why did you take the miss? He said, because you called it. Yeah, so yeah. Them, because I've called it, he's took the miss. But if mm -hmm. I hadn't called the miss, he'd have been quite happy because he knows how difficult the shot was. And mm -hmm. it was just a certain criteria that I used to decide whether or not it was a miss. But I think in the amateur game, people just need to realise, do you know what? You're not professional. Mm -hmm. So your expectation of whether or not you should hit that ball should be a lot less. Because these guys do play a different game. I know yeah. it's on the, the table's the same size, balls are the same. Um, okay, you can argue about the, the cloth and the, the weight of the balls and how well looked after the table is. But in terms of the dimensions, and it's still 22 balls. Mm -hmm. But as an amateur, you haven't yet learned to play the shots. So yeah. don't expect, because you see, a referee on TV calling a miss against pick somebody, any player, mm -hmm. a miss. Don't think that when your opponent plays that shot, you should also be calling a miss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your opponent <laughs> isn't Ronnie O'Sullivan or John Higgins or Judd Trump or Matt Selby. They're, they're only one of these guys, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you need to dial down your expectation to this is an amateur game. And this is the level these guys play at. And but you know yourself, Lee, this is a topic of conversation that just is never going to stop. Yeah, I know. I know, I know it's, it's a minefield, isn't it? It's got to be up, up to the interpretation of the, the referee. I mean, in our league, our local league, uh, you only get one miss. And, yeah. and there was a lot of fighting about the miss rule, uh, but you only get one miss. It's like if you're coming off one cushion, mm. you know, to... to 
to hit a ball. I think even in the amateur game, you should hit that because a lot of the time you need that one shot to get the angle right. Yeah. You know, but if you choose to play off three cushions, it's always going yeah. to be a miss. Yeah. I think, I, think, I mean, I, again, I, I've referred to social media a few times, but that's where a lot of this discussion takes place. And, excuse me, I've, I've read posts where people are saying, but a player, uh, maybe a commentator will say, he's used that first attempt as a, as a guide. Yeah. And people will respond to that saying, almost accusing him of cheating, by saying, well, he shouldn't be allowed to use that as a guide. But you have to take into account, well, sorry, we don't when we're uh, reffing the game, but you have to accept that players are playing shots, not just to hit a ball, they're playing for tactical reasons and tactical mm -hmm. position and all the rest of it. And there's just, I remember when the, uh, one of the, when it was first introduced, I saw a match that Jimmy was playing. Mm -hmm. And the, the cue ball was down near the, the pack, but there was a single red up behind the green spot, four inches off the cushion. And Jimmy decided to play that red. He couldn't see it, but he decided to come off the cushion, play the red, presumably to hopefully knock it off the table and leave his opponent stuck behind the ball cars. Mm. Great tactical shot. But equally, it could just have rolled into the pack. Yeah, <laughs> and left them so, nothing. So, so when he plays that shot and doesn't reach the red, he's going to get called to throw the miss all day long. Yeah. But he was choosing that. That was his tactical decision. And that's why uh, he's chosen that shot. But equally, a player can choose to hit this ball as thin as possible. And if anything, I'm going to err on the thin side. Mm -hmm. By doing that, they might not make contact, so they will get called a foul on the mass. But they've got to err on the thin side because <clears> at that level, if they can leave the red on the frame over. Exactly, exactly. But I think it's you know we all, we all view the game for the entertainment of it, but I think people need to understand maybe a wee bit more. Yeah, players are doing things. The rule book says it's black and white. You, you must, to the best of your ability, try to hit a ball on. That's it. There's no mention of tactics. I think no. once in the whole rule book it says tactic, and it says that there is from time to time a tactic of laying snookers. That was it. Mm -hmm. So, from a referee's point of view, we can't say, well, I'm not calling a miss there because I know he's trying to get it safe. It's just, <laughs> you know, it's, can he or can he not hit the ball on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I wonder, Leo, if we could uh, kind of to round off, but to do a little bit of a quick fire round with you. Um, we do this with all of the guests and we call it clearing the colours. So uh, we just go yellow, green, brown, blue, pink, black, and we ask you a question for each one if uh, if you okay. if you humorous on this one, if you don't mind. Um, so the first mean, one then. You mean be humorous on this? <laughs> well, we, well, no pressure. That's no natural. Pressure. <laughs> Um, okay, so the yellow one is, um, and again, this is all very subjective as to how you find people yourself, but just wonder if you've got any opinion on who you think the funniest player is that you've come across. Funniest player? Interesting. Mark Selby's got a great sense of humour. That gets lost, doesn't it, sometimes, the persona on the table, but you're right, a lot of people say that, don't they? Yeah, but then... <clears throat> we don't all go to our work and tell jokes all the time. <laughs> and you're at your work, you're, whatever it is you're doing, whether you work in a factory or drive some sort of machinery, you're, you're concentrating on what you're doing. So when he's, when he's doing his job, yeah. that's what he's doing, he concentrates. But uh, there's, there's lots of them are, are funny. Mm. Yeah. Hussein Bafai is a funny guy. He's, yeah. He comes in Sorry? He comes across pretty well. To see yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a lovely guy. Yeah, yeah. Mark Allen, got a good sense of humour. Yeah. So, the, funny, the funniest one, yeah, right, we'll go with Marcel, because he's the first one that springs to mind. Well, 
just to say I've lost my sheet of paper for my questions. <laughs> but that, that's I what I was doing there. I was trying to locate my sheet of paper. But I, I think I know. Michael, this is a point in which you need to fill, as they say. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I'm either going to do... See, we joke about stuff like this. I'm either going to edit this bit out and let you recover, Lee, or I'm going to let this stay in and just make just see let everyone see the human side of this. What goes behind <laughs> this, this. This will go in the Christmas bloopers list. <laughs> yeah. Most of our bloopers stay in, if I'm honest. I, I, I know what my next question is, Leo. What's your, your favourite venue outside, out with the Crucible? So apart from the Crucible, your favourite venue? Um... For, for the venue itself. Yeah, favourite venue to referee in. Um, I think it's got to be York. Yeah. The Barbican in York. Mm. Even a lot of the players have said York, haven't they, Michael, mm. for, yeah. for their yeah. favourite venue? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice venue. Do you know what nobody said yet, though? Nobody said Milton Keynes. <laughs> Yeah, Milton Keynes. Exactly. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, we, so, have, we, we, we have had tournaments there. <laughs> the, the, the hubris bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, this one, again, interesting in your thoughts, really, Leo. So who do you think the, the next first-time world champion will be? So debut mm. world champion. Interesting. Because we've had some great results this season. Um, and Zhao Jing Tong, what a performance he, he's put on. Um, so, assuming that he's going to progress, it, it could be him, it could be the, the next sort of debut winner, for, which would make him the first Chinese player, I suppose. Um, yeah. But... Jack Lazowski is he's done tremendous this season as well. So is is uh, I think of Jack as being similar in style to Judd. Mm. And you know that sort of the naughty snooker thing that Judd yeah. <laughs> used to like to talk about playing. Um and he's now honed his game to such a, a level. And mm. Jack is, is a similar style. Mm. But mm. I mean, that's because you've got all sorts of responses saying to lose to all rocks as well, saying referees, because he doesn't know anything about playing the game. <laughs> but then, um, yeah, Zhao Jing Tong, I think, is a tremendous player. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's the, the brown, I think, isn't it, Michael? Brown that's the, down. That's the brown. The brown is gone. So this is your blue ball question, Leo. Okay. Which actor would you get to play you in a film of your life? Oh, my goodness, there's a question. <laughs> <laughs> Which actor? It's a tricky blue. Yeah, I should, I should really say somebody nice like uh, Brad Pitt or something like that. Who <laughs> 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 might need to shave his head. Um, You'll not be the first. Just like, who would play me? It would depend on what kind of film I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've no idea. I really have. Um, well, we'll go with Brad Pitt. Nah, because I'll, 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 I'll get such abuse for that that I'll, I'll just never be able to live it down. Somebody <laughs> like... Um, who do I think of? What about Bruce Willis? Yeah. I mean, we're helping you get the blue away now, but, but Bruce Willis or Ross Kemp, somebody like that? Oh, is that, as you see me, some sort of action type Film star. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's a link back to the police time. I think that's where I'm going back to that. <laughs> All right, 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 of course. Um, I'll go with. Can I ask my wife? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. <Great. laughs> if if I was to have someone play me, an actor to play me, <laughs> who would it be? I meet you later. The voice. Who? <laughs> yeah, the American guy that's got the voice that you like. Morgan Freeman? Yeah. Morgan Freeman. Oh, Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. <laughs> I mean, fantastic. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what, Tom, Tom Hanks. Hanks. Tom Hanks. 
the blue's gone. Blue, we got that. Um, yep. Th- th- this is hopefully, again, this is just in terms of what you find, Leo. We're nearly there. On the pink, a nice soft one. What about what about the nicest player? Is there anyone you just think, oh, you know, what a great, what a great person or just the way they come across in politeness or just generally as a person? Um, nicest person. I'm going to go with John Higgins. Mm. He's just so down the air. Just an out and out nice guy. I mean, there's, there's, there's loads of them, but He'll do. Yeah, so it's good choice, good choice. This is uh, the black ball, Leo. This is to clear the table. Um, what would you call your autobiography if you wrote one? You might need to get Joyce back in. Oh, when you write one. This is tough. <laughs> when you write one. What would I call? Um, hand in glove. There we go. That was an easy one. I just came straight off the top of my head. <laughs> Perfect. Like, like most of my hair is done. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. That's cleared the colours successfully. The blue wobbled a little bit, I have to say, but uh, you, you know, you managed to. You got there in the end. So yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think all, all... it's a question you would never think to get asked. <laughs> it's when you're put on the spot. It's yeah. Quite difficult. We were trying to get, trying to mimic the nerves that people face before the crucible by giving a really tricky blue there. That's what we were doing. All right, okay. <laughs> Couldn't lead you into that or give you any time to think about it. That that would have taken the whole effect away. <laughs> really too easy. So, so I suppose it's just to, for, well, certainly from my point, um, Leo, I, I've not met before and um, seen you lots of times on TV and you, you come across as a, just a, a smashing fella. So just want to thank you really for, for coming on here with us and giving us a chance to find out what it's like to be a, a snooker referee, but also, you know, an interesting story outside of the referee. And so, so just thank you very much from me. Thank you for asking me. It's been my pleasure. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks very much, Leo. It's always a pleasure to speak to you and we look forward to see you, seeing you on the telly refereeing well, again. So thanks very much for your time. Thanks a lot, Lee. All the best. Thanks, mate. Take care.